Hey everyone. As folks are starting to come in here, I think we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started. Folks who are coming in, uh, feel free to come towards the front of the room. I won't bite. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Gary Holloway. Uh, I've been asked to facilitate this discussion on supporting downtowns. Um, in my profession, I'm the downtown program manager for the state of Vermont. So I work with downtowns um, across Vermont, helping them in normal days, um, but also in, in crises too, right? We get called to all kinds of duties. So um, in my day job, that's what I'm doing is to help support downtowns. And obviously a lot of attention has been put towards Montpelier. I'm also a resident uh, of Montpelier. I live in the Town Hill neighborhood. Um, my, my, my home and my family are okay. We were, we were spared by the, by the flooding. Um, but we know that a lot of folks um, in this room and our community were significantly impacted by the flooding. And we're here today uh, kind of building off the conversation that many of us were at a couple weeks ago to talk about um, what we're scared about, you know, what were, you know, actionable items that um, we can move forward. Um, so a lot was expressed a couple weeks ago um, just to kind of lay everything on the table. Today we're trying to take it a step further and we're trying to move towards uh, some things that we may be able to do together as a community. Um, so we're going to really try to think about positive, forward-thinking ideas that have action behind them. Um, and we're not going to, although we can still be frustrated, um, and that's okay to express that, we're not going to spend too much time on what could have happened, but what we can now do moving forward. Um, so all the ideas that, um, that are going to be expressed here today are going to be recorded. Uh, we have a scribe over here that's taking all the ideas, so we don't want you to think that we're doing our best to capture everything in all of the sessions. And uh, what we're trying to get to after our, you know, our 50 minutes, however much time we have here together, is to really identify those two or three things. We have a list of ideas, and they're all important, but we really want to get to two or three things both short term that we can feel like we can have some achievement towards as well as some long term things that we can work together. Now who's going to do these things? Um, all of us or maybe some of us. Um, but what we're not going to do is hand the list over to the city and say here's the laundry list of things that the city's going to do for us or that the state should do or that the federal government should do for us. We're all partners in this and we all are going to have to stand behind the things that we come up with in the room and that's what we're going to try to get to. Um, on the, on the 7th of September, we're going to take these kind of top ideas uh, from all the different rooms. And there may be some ideas that don't make it to the top. But as we kind of look through all the ideas from all nine sessions, we might see a theme that emerges in every single room that we say, you know what, this needs to be a priority. And we pull it into that. And then on September 7th, we're going to talk more about that and figure out what the action plan is and who's going to line up behind it and who's, you know, how are we going to get this done. Um, let me see if there's any other. And the other thing I'm just going to kind of set this tone for, and then we're gonna, I'm going to start to hear from all of you, is you know, we think about supporting downtowns. There's lots of ways we can support the downtown, right? We know that the businesses have been impacted. We know that the residences have been impacted. Property owners, our public spaces, um, the events that we like coming to in downtown or, or haven't been happening or they've been happening somewhere else. They've been happening up at the College Green, which is which fortunate that we have that. Um, we need to think about reimagining, as Sarah said, at the end that things are going to look different and we have to adapt to that change. I really appreciate how she framed that. As we reopen downtown, it's not like we're going to flick a switch and it's all going to be back open again. We're going to see businesses that are going to open up in a couple weeks or a month. We're going to see a few more businesses open up a month later. Some businesses will never return. So there's going to be a lot of different changes and things, and we're going to have to kind of think about that as, as we reopen the downtown, as we promote the downtown to others to come and visit again. So I want to spend about 10 minutes just thinking about what are all the things that we're doing already, collectively as a community, to support the downtown. And that can be anything. And I'm not going to give anyone really more than a minute. I'm going to hold the mic. Um, and so this is an opportunity for you to kind of share quickly some ideas, um, one or two. And then I'm going to move on to the next person so that everyone in the room feels like they have a chance to speak. And we're going to spend about 10 minutes just talking about what's already existing and supporting so we can kind of get that documented. And then we'll move into the ideas uh, that we can uh, 
uh, discuss together and then prioritize in the last 20 minutes. But before I jump into that, I want to recognize that we have some resource members in the room here who are um, either those who were directly involved, um, like Montpelier Live, um, we have some representatives here and I'll have them introduce themselves, who were involved directly with the response and recovery during this flood, or we may have others in the room who were, who were around during Tropical Storm Irene um, and were helping other communities um, during this time. Um, and then we have, um, we have some other experts in the room that have kind of a broad range of experience dealing with fires or dealing with floods or dealing with other types of disasters in downtowns that can be just there to, they're here to listen, they're here to provide a little perspective for the community to listen to. Um, so we really appreciate they're taking their time to be here. And then we have um, our scribe over here. So I'm going to start with, um, with Alice, um, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself quickly. Hi, I'm Alice and I work with Gary at the State of Vermont and I'm your scribe. I'm Peter Wuck. I'm a resident of Montpelier, uh, helped my, with Montpelier Live flood relief efforts, and I run Efficiency Vermont, so I'm here in that hat, too. Help is an understatement there. Thanks, Peter. Hi, I'm Bob Stevens. I'm an engineer with Stevens & Associates down in Brattleboro and a developer. So I own a bunch of buildings. I've done a lot of design work, a lot of flood re restoration design after Irene. I'm Katie Trouts, and I'm the director of Montpelier Alive. And uh, many of you know I've been working on this since day one. Thank you, Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm Leanne Tingay. Uh, I was Gary before Gary. <laughs> And, uh, and was around for, I, I know, it's so <laughs> weird. Um, I was around for uh, the recovery during Irene. Right now, I'm also with, I'm a senior program associate with um, the Orton Family Foundation's Community Heart and Soul. And I have other resource members in the back here, right? And if I forget anyone who is not listed on the resource team, please, please help me. Hi, I'm Rebecca Ellis. I'm the state director for uh, Senator Peter Welch. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I was also the chair of the Waterbury Select Board and one of the two state reps during Tropical Storm Irene, and I led Waterbury's long-term community planning process, which was about a nine-month effort, somewhat similar to this, and took about five, ten years to complete. <laughs> I'm M.K. Monley. I was president of Revitalizing Waterbury during Tropical Storm Irene. Rebecca was a rock star. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Lee Schlegel. Um, I helped uh, <laughs> Rebecca and M.K. during Tropical Storm Irene, and I am the vice chair of our long-term recovery committee this time around in Waterbury. Did I miss any uh, resource team members that are here? I know you all are resources, but did I miss anyone who was called out as a resource member? Okay, it's great to have you all here. Um, Alice, you're gonna help me keep track of time if we get too long, right? All right. Um, I'm gonna go around the room. Now we're gonna spend, like I said, 10 minutes talking about what we already, uh, what are the um, things that we're already doing to support downtown. And um, be brief, be concise, but if you can introduce yourself, if you're affiliated with a business, if you're affiliated with an organization, you can share that. Or if you're just a resident, um, maybe just um, share us what neighbor neighborhood you live in. Um, and we'll just do it like that. Um, so I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, and I'm going to do my best to run around crazy with the mic. Anyone like to start? It's a heavy mic, too. I'm going to get a workout. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to introduce myself. I'm Kelly Murphy, the assistant city manager, just here to listen. And I also wanted to uh, notice Jack McCullough in the back there, the mayor, just to Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. I'm Ann Cummings. I'm one of your state senators. I'm a represent I live in Montpelier and I was the mayor during the ninety two flood and the recovery efforts. So really a lot of experience here in the room. Um, so let's get some ideas out there. Like what what are we doing to support downtown right right now? Um, to, to support the recovery efforts. Let's try and get those ideas out there so we're not missing anything as we start to come up with our own ideas. 
I just want to say thank you to Montpelier Alive for developing the hub and organizing all the volunteers in the hours after the flood. That was a huge help for Bethany Church, where I'm the minister, and um, that's been terrific, so the organization. My name is Joe Castellano. I live over on Sabin Street. And uh, just in order to try and support any sort of business, which primarily Shaw's at this point downtown, I shop there as often as I can. And then uh, my wife and I supported the Rome sale that they had. And we also support the businesses up on the green during the farmer's market. So we really appreciate that. Great. Yeah, there's a merchant's market happening at the College Green. Go there Saturday morning when you go to the farmer's market. It's going to be up there for a little while. I'm Michael Sherman, and I'm a resident up in the, near the college. Um, I just wanted, my wife and I used to make fun of the fact that we listened to Garrison Keillor's, uh, and, and one of his, his uh, sponsors were Ralph's Pretty Good Grocery. You may remember that. The, 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 the logo was, if you can't find it at Ralph's, you can probably do without it. Um, and what, and when that's basically saying, try to shop in, in the downtown. Do everything, you know, if, try to find it first here, and then if you can't find it, think about whether you need it, but then, you know, I know we have lots of temptations around us, but that's important. Buy what, if you're gonna, what you're gonna buy, try to buy it here. Um, hi, my name is Ann Ferguson. I live on North Franklin Street, and um, I wanna echo what Michael just said, especially relative to Front Porch Forum and how it is such a great vehicle to let us know what is opened and so that we can go and support it. I'm Eric Gilbertson, I used to work for the state and I work for the Preservation Trust of Vermont and we try to help in planning downtown. I know we've got assessments going on in three of the churches. Um, I'm Glenn Hutchison. I work at the drawing board and I'm one of the owners at the front. Um, and I guess I would say as far as what's happening now, uh, I think that it's worth noting that the businesses are helping each other in interesting ways. The drawing board, uh, for example, is, this is to be figured out, but we're planning to hire uh, Annabelle, who is on staff at Capital Copy, and open something like a Capital Copy function under the drawing board name. Um, we need more space to do that. Um, and we're trying to work with uh, folks who own Abishans uh, to work out where that space might be, among other possibilities. Um, and then, for example, at the front, uh, maybe less of a business in a way, but we are still officially a business. And, and we're working with uh, other arts organizations around to um, at least coordinate our, our show openings, because we're still having shows. So just trying to kind of co uh, advertise. So come out on September 1st for an art opening. Um, but yeah, I think that that kind of collaboration between businesses and the kind of openness uh, is already happening and it is helpful. It feels like it isn't perhaps uh, uh, the, the cutthroat model. <laughs> uh, and I think that that's helpful uh, in this situation to kind of be a little more open. Yes, most of you may know this, and I don't know all the details, but I will mention that I understand there are conversations going on between five churches that have been providing community lunch in their own churches and working on seeing if there's a space that they can collaborate on and share together, perhaps with the food pantry, but I don't know about that yet. And is that, that idea came up when Jillian had mentioned that, or someone had mentioned at the last meeting, right, like a shared, a shared kitchen amongst the, amongst yes, the churches, a shared food, food pantry, and yeah. Yes, yeah. that's what I'm trying to say. Great, yeah. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that, yeah. Um, yeah, please help me point to. Hi, I'm Sharon uh, White Estes, and I'm the owner of Althea's Attic Boutique downtown. And in the vein of collaboration, uh, what a group of us neighbors have been doing is um, doing pop-ups together in bigger spaces, which might be charging a, a fee to rent. Uh, so just to give you an, I for instance, last Thursday we went to Bar Hill and there were four of us and we split the, you know, 1250 and we had um, 
it was marketed by Bar Hill. We also independently marketed, and we're continuing to look for events and, and event opportunities like that because we're ready to just get out there and do what we do best and um, support our neighbors in doing the same and giving everybody um, some variety in their shopping opportunities. Sorry to make you walk across the room, Gary. Um, I just wanted to highlight there are some resources that the uh, State Emergency Board identified that can help uh, residents with heating, hot water, and other appliance needs, as well as we've identified some resources uh, through Vision Zimrat to support businesses with some of their uh, appliance and equipment needs. It's not gonna be sufficient uh, for anybody, but it is something to help, um, and those details of that program will be announced on the Tuesday after uh, Labor Day, as we've had to do a lot of work to get those ready to go to be able to access by folks. But they'll be uh, retroactive back to uh, the day of the flood. So if you bought equipment, you can access those. So we're gonna, we're gonna transition now. Is there anything else that we need to get on the table like that we for forgot to mention? Things that's already happening, the support downtown? All right. The Montpelier Strong Fund, what, 1.8 million or 1.6 million, well, pretty amazing. Um, thank you all for in the room here that were help, help raise that money. I quickly want to speak to a few of the other things that Montpelier Alive is helping with um, because these are the things that are happening now. Um, the Montpelier Strong Fund advocacy for the businesses and uh, giving them space and opportunity to speak about their experiences. Um, and developing partnerships as we go along, which I think will play a really important role as we enter this rebuild phase. Um, and also assembling resources for the downtown and for the businesses. These are all things I'm working on every day and are a big part of that initial, um, the initial picture. Last, last one, okay, and last one. Peter jogged my memory. Um, the emergency board also approved $20 million for um, business uh, grants. It, so that's out there too. Yeah, that's, that's through the Agency of Commerce, BGAP is the acronym, um, up to $20,000 grants available. So hopefully folks can get access to that. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna transition now uh, into, let's see our time here. Uh, now, now we're going to look at some actionable ideas, um, forward-thinking, positive, actionable ideas um, that would be that our community can get behind. Once again, this isn't a list we're handing someone else. This is things that we may need to participate in or work together with existing organizations or the city with um, or present to the city to consider, right? So these can be big ideas, but let's think of both short-term and long-term ideas. Um, so we can we can get a wide array of things. So we're going to spend spend some time now talking about that. Uh, quick, sort of a, a FEMA term. I think uh, looking at ways to harden existing buildings, uh, uh, washable uh, uh, surfaces, uh, using metal uh, two by fours instead of wood, because you could just wash them off. Uh, in Minnesota, some people actually fill the basements with clean water uh, to match the flooding. And that avoids the mud and avoids pressures on the foundation. So that's... <laughs> that's great. Good idea. Um, yeah, Joe. Yeah, hi. Um, I'd like to address this to some of the people who were uh, related or were Waterbury during the Irene. Yeah because obviously they have some firsthand experience on what they did to recover, and I think that would be helpful as far as insight to make our downtown more resilient. Yeah. Yeah. Waterbury, team can, Waterbury team can think about that um, as we're going around if you want to chime in now or in a minute. Um, other folks? Hi, my name, my name is Mark. I do not live here, but I'm a professional consultant looking at this observing it. I'm a designer, an architect, and urban designer. At any rate, I do like what was mentioned about some of the merchants gathering and doing pop-ups. I, I would highly encourage as much of the community as can is to enliven the street, maybe on a programmed 
uh, basis for as long as the weather holds out uh, and as long as you can uh, be resilient to that to get people on the street doing business and commerce uh, for convenience and for entertainment um, uh, until things start to stabilize. So I don't know who would be the leader of that in this community, if it's the Chamber of Commerce or if it's uh, the live group or, or whatnot, but I think Feed on the Street will help uh, nurture uh, uh, you know, resilience. It'll help nurture kind of a sense of ownership, again, a regaining a sense of downtown. And, and again, I would encourage something like that to happen as en masse and uh, programmatically as you can. I think you really would enjoy it as a community. I'll, I'll come and buy some stuff too. <laughs> Well, I, I uh, was uh, working at the Vermont Historical Society when we had the big ice flow. Uh, that, and one of the things that w we had all of our collections in the basement of the pavilion. Um, we, were, we were lucky that we, the, the, the legislature was in session and they, get, they made a, 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 a fire gang and we recovered everything out of the... But it, it, the important thing that I want to get at is that many of the losses, many of the businesses are in their inventory, which is stored in the basement. And I, one of the things I've been thinking about, is there a way for the city to get involved in the construction of or the re renovation of buildings so that there can be a common above flood grain, uh, fl floodplain storage area that all the merchants can use so that they don't have to store things in their basements and suffer that loss every time there's a flood? Uh, one of the things that I was talking to uh, Glenn about a little bit earlier, it's sort of a hodgepodge as far as landlords being able to help out, uh, you know, whether they forgive rent or whether they're able to contribute in some way to some of the losses of some of the business owners. And I'm wondering if maybe we can have some sort of community organization to reach out to all the landlords downtown and figure out how we might have a more cohesive system rather than, a, you know, a piecemeal. And the other thing is um, I would encourage us to explore grants because a lot of the business owners I've talked to have said that they're not interested in having another small business loan. I mean, their margins are slim enough to, as, it, as it is, and in, to encourage them to come back, they need to have grants. There's always a small thing called money, and um, this doesn't recognize that. But there are many towns who have built different kinds of s streetscapes that are intentionally above the, the level and I was struck by the person who was talking about uh, Artisan's Hand and how they, they sort of watched the water all around them and that building was built after the standards were, were put in place. Um, I don't know what it would take to, uh, what kinds of massive infusion of money to rebuild the cityscape, but if we want Montpelier in proximity to rivers, um, it seems to me that has to be part of the long-term plan. I, I wanted to just share a thought about understanding the long-term implications of whether buildings get hardened that meet the floodplain and what the long-term implications are if you don't do that with respect to future operational costs for insurance, for changes in the floodplain ordinance. There's a lot of things that may sort of whittle away at people's assets, their, their properties, if you're not able to bring it up to speed. So um, there, there's a broader understanding of the implications of this. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot in sort of the immediate aftermath, there was a clear set of inequities that existed amongst the, those who were rec recovering. Some were way ahead, some had massive GoFundMe campaigns, some were piecemealing as they go and needed a lot of help. I'd love to maybe, Katie, this is something we could think about it, is understanding what the universe of need is still out there in terms of helping those who are further behind try to catch up so that we can have that full, vibrant downtown and not just those who have been able to recover quickly. That's a good short-term one to identify. Um, well, we'll see if the community, you all decide, you know, not me, but that is a, an example of a short-term 
Okay, so here's another short-term one that's absolutely free, and that is that it's like a ghost town downtown. And the more people that are downtown, the more vibrant it is. And um, when I'm downtown and I run into people that are from away, I'm like, oh, let me talk to you about this, and let me show you that. And, you know, so I think uh, many of us can do that, and, and it won't be any cost or just get downtown and be downtown and greet people. High impact, low cost is really a, a good thing to look at, right? That's a, that's a free one. Free is good. Oh, I didn't, I didn't but uh, Sarah DeFelice in the last one said, let's have a flower bomb downtown. And I read shortly thereafter that Barry did a lot of that immediately. And I've been looking at my planters on my deck that don't have flowers yet and wondering if as soon as they bloom, I should take them downtown. And that, too, would be free. Um, name is Mark Seltzer. Building upon uh, what the uh, two folks next to me said, I think the short-term plans, thinking through how we can make the downtown appear appealing to uh, tourists who are coming to town, those who are going to hit up the couple shops we have open, is thinking through whether we can have maybe a mural in a lot of the um, empty storefronts that haven't yet been able to rebuild. Those who've started to put drywall up and whatnot might not want to do that, but those that are sort of look like ghost towns, maybe a mural, a community mural, maybe photographs of what the flood looked like and what we're doing to rebuild, painting a picture and telling a story. Hi, I'm MK from Waterbury. And um, in addition to being president of Revitalizing Waterbury, I was the art teacher at the primary school. And um, art is going to be important to the healing process of y'all. And um, one of the things we did was we put together an After Irene Floodgates art project that actually opened a year after Irene. And we went around a group of artists in town and had kits together and, you know, just asked people to express yourself. What's your reaction to the flood? And then we put together um, this amazing art show that people would come in and just burst into tears looking at it. Um, and it was a heal part of the healing. Um, but I also like the idea of like bringing people back downtown. Like I come to Montpelier to shop. I love Montpelier, you know. It like breaks my heart. And um, yeah, I want to be here. I want to come where you're at Bar Hill and I don't want you to have to pay Bar Hill to be there. I want I want to go down this. Let's put flowers in the street. Let's have a block party, you know. Can they hose off the streets and bring in a band and you know to build on that right so um i'm lish Legland. my day job i work for the alchemist which was famously flooded in irene and so um john and jen came and hosted Oktoberfest, right like two months after and so we had a giant street party it is important to have parties it is important to do things that really bring people together as i say give people have reasons to stroll right you can still put together a scavenger hunt you know that things that people can look for whether they, you know, are able to, to do lots of things. The piece that's really important to hold on to is how much you love your downtown, how much you love this community, how much people love being here, saying it again and again in every way possible. You know, and I don't want to be like Debbie Downer. It takes a long time. It's a, a multi-year process, right? As Rebecca said, right, we had a nine-month visioning process. We sent love letters to the state employees who were missing, right? They were up at IBM in Essex. We brought them Valentine's. We brought them Halloween candy. We went again and again and again. So they knew how much we wanted them back and how much we missed their business and how much we missed their presence. And we did that with, you know, the, the same way, um, you know, supporting restaurant staff, supporting people who are not here. It, those are things that you can do and keep reminding people that, you know, we love you and we want to um, see you here. Thank you. One here and then you. I'll just pick up on one of the things that Anne said. Uh, Dublin apparently has some ki uh, kind of arrangement where you meet a Dubliner 
and you sign up and they take you to a coffee shop or something like that and then and you have for a few hours a conversation in which that person says well you should be sure to see this and that and so on and uh, and a friend of mine did that and he has been in contact with that person for years now um, so it really creates a bond. It also creates a kind of uh, you know, travel agency thing. But you, you, you could do it with little vouchers for the places where they can get food and have an informal conversation. So I have two things. Um, the first is that uh, Bethany Church, while our building has a lot of issues with it right now, our green space in front of the church is wide open and the lawn is mowed and it would be a great place once um, people at the farmer's market, or, I mean, I, I, this Sunday's the last farmer's market, is that? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Because, you know, if you want to, come down and use the lawn, it's right there and it's downtown and it gets people into the downtown again. The second thing is that I've been in conversation with Joan Javier Duval, who's the minister at the Unitarian Church, and she and I are talking about um, something called a vigil of lamentation, where the whole community could come together and have uh, a time of grief, of, of um, processing the grief that's going on. And um, we're kind of feeling people out to see if that's something that you would be interested in, so. Um, I'm mostly here to listen to the ideas in the room, but I did want to mention, just to put on your radar, um, in terms of cleanup, uh, August 26th, this Saturday, is officially a green up day. We will have tables at VSF, VCFA and um, at the Volunteer Hub to pick up bags and gloves. And um, we really realize that it's important to have our streets looking nice, especially for the upcoming tourist season. So everyone doing a little more in that way. Um, and also, I have been meeting with Vermont Tourism, uh, and I plan to meet next week with the Arts Council, because these ideas that you're talking about, you're not alone in thinking that, and I would love to hear more of those artistic-based ideas and find some partners in making some things happen. We have a wonderful Public Arts Commission uh, with the City of Montpelier, and um, I think this would be a great opportunity to also talk to them. Um, there is a, an Abenaki uh, mural uh, and a grand opening, I think, coming up, and I forget the date, but um, there will be things happening, and uh, it's never enough, so keep the ideas coming. It's a quick, dumb idea, but Montpelier used to celebrate bud season, and what about tours of downtown? I bet people are really curious about what happened and what people are doing. Tours. Oh, tours. tours, just no, not bus tours, walking tours of downtown, peek in the doors, see what condition the buildings are in. Uh, merchants could put out tables, do stuff like that. I think the One Period Alive has done an amazing job, and the merchants downtown have been so innovative. I think that's to get people back. Oh, yeah, thanks. Hi, Sabrina Fadile. Um, so I had written in my notes, empty storefronts, boards, murals, and Katie will tell you I come up with public art idea projects all the time. Um, and so I'm stewing on a public art flood project already, and on September 30th, there's going to be a Bent Nails Bistro fundraiser in the street of Langdon Street with bands all day long and a celebration. So music's coming back. We were talking uh, with the chief of police, and I understand that they are going to be doing a, a washing of the sidewalks, and then then the, after that they're going to sweep the streets. So they're working on trying to clean it up and make it look really sharp. A cleansing. Um, two things: one a short term and one long term. I noticed on Lang speaking of Langing Street, I noticed on Langing Street the. Um, flood marker on the bridge. Um, someone had stickered something on there. I think definitely having uh, an official marker put up as well as photos of what this flood looked like uh, to sort of tell the story and bring tourists back into town will be helpful. And I think that having 
dedicated storefront alone um, to be able to have photos of the events and um, you know what the future will be with it can be an art project or whatever else. More of the long term, I know we had someone from Efficiency Vermont, and one of the things I saw on our um, agenda here was you know purchasing heat. I was wondering if we've thought about and if it's possible to maybe do a community heat plant for all of the downtown businesses, if that's a viable option, something we can think through, and if that would be efficiency. I was in Waterbury a couple weeks ago, and um, they were just Prohibition Pig was just reopening for the first few hours, and on the side of their wall, they had a um, just a play off of what you were saying. There was a, a canoe, and it said July, whatever date it was, 10th, um, you know, flood, flood, um, canoe parking here. And so it was kind of a play, and they had pictures of where the flood water was, and then you could turn around and see what you were just saying, talking about where Irene was and the historic flood was. And so, anyway, just wanted to share that. Um, so there was a question about what did Waterbury do after Tropical Storm Irene? It's so complex, I don't think I wanna list all of the projects that happened, but I do wanna emphasize that um, we went through a process similar to this. It was about a nine month process. We went through a lot of ideas. We came up with about 21 ideas. I was just looking at the list of ideas right now and kind of laughing at some of them. Some of, we did about half of them, um, but I think it was more important to go through the process we did many more things than are, that, are, that are not on that list as well, but um, for each project, they were sort of bigger ideas, like um, hire or a downtown business um, promoter, you know, manager, somebody like Katie, um, which we didn't have at the time. And then that person was able to then generate a whole bunch of ideas and do a whole bunch of things. Um, in terms of hardening structures, probably the best example is the state office complex. That wasn't the town that did that, that was the state, but that was a four-year project. Um, there's some really great ideas there, probably not possible for every little um, organization. We also had an idea to do a pilot project with FEMA using hazard mitigation funds to elevate 10 homes. We ended up only doing one because it was at the time, very bureaucratic, but maybe this time around it's less so. But anyway, I guess I just want to emphasize that it's just a really, it's the more important thing is to go through the process and come up with your ideas and then have a champion for those ideas and go forward with them because whatever you do will be great. And I can't remember the number, but someone just last week, and I don't remember if it was Karen Nevin, but she had said like, we've, we've achieved, we, we've implemented like 20 of those, 23 or whatever the number was. It was like pretty remarkable, but it's helpful to have that, those goals set, right? To try to work towards and it, it's taken, you know, five to ten years to get to get through that list. Uh, this is more of a question for Roberta. Now, did you guys contact the Army Corps of Engineers to help with flood resiliency downtown? Um, so one of our projects was to look at river management and doing a, a study in, of the river, and we got some grant money to do that. I think it was FEMA money, um, and we actually hired a... a um, Malona McBroom, which is a, happens to be in Waterbury. We did not end up with Army Corps of Engineers, but that doesn't mean that you can't ask them for funds. They've done projects in Montpelier, so they might be well suited to do a project going forward. So this is kind of a detailed building on some of the things that have been said, but maybe the city council or uh, the police department so they might consider when you get more activity in the street, whether it's a carnival or an evening or maybe it's a program thing, particularly in tourist season, maybe there can be an, you know, a, in as much as indoor spaces may not be available, that you have a limited block or so of an open liquor license where people can walk around with a beer, go between, you know, vendors or represent the business owners there, you know, and have a little night of activity, but it's in a very controlled, managed way. But again, to get more people moving around uh, in the downtown in, in, you know, in, entertaining themselves, basically, you know, things. How much time we got? Ten. Okay, I, I'm going to work my way. <laughs> the scribe has an idea. Okay, hold on a second, Alice. Uh, many towns have uh, maps with uh, walking tours, and there was one from Montpelier, and actually there were two, there were two, volume, two short brochure type books f uh, in 1976, I think, about historic homes, historic buildings in Montpelier. So I think, and I've noticed that the activities, what you can do in Montpelier, those maps that are around the city, they've been just disappearing out of the, so that would be good if we could get another walk around of Montpelier um, map for self-guided tours. 
I remember uh, Harris, who I used to be on the Complete Streets Committee with, and Harris came up with this uh, this map of like interesting things around Montpelier. And I, maybe some of you participated in that walk, but it's really interesting. Like how many hearts are on top of the Methodist Church, right? Those kind of interesting things that are all around, you don't see them. Um, so anyway, great idea. Um, where else? And I'll make my way to you next, Alice. Well, as we all know, fall is coming pretty quickly. And I like the idea, somebody had mentioned earlier about an Oktoberfest. And I'm thinking that with Montpelier Alive, maybe we do some sort of promotion like an Oktoberfest and maybe some sort of art installation downtown. And if you send something out to like the Boston Globe, Christopher Mother, who's the travel guy, or you can get a mention in there, maybe you know help draw, start drawing some people downtown or drawing people to, back to Montpelier. So my question was about um, platforms that allow people to do community supported, you would know what this is called, community supported, um, not fundraising, but like investing in small businesses, enterprises. Um, and if that would be something that, I don't know if Montpelier Alive would be involved in that, or if there was some platform that could be promoted to businesses to use as a, as a way for people in Montpelier to invest in the small businesses directly. So community supported enterprises, and there's there's a lot of models of, of that around the state. Um, I was just thinking about the church example of like shared kitchen, right? That's kind of a, in a way, a form of a community supported enterprise, um, so that you can provide um, prepared foods for the community. I just like to echo what Rebecca Ellis just said. We've had a lot of conversation around elevating the downtown, moving it to up to the up to the college, all the things that could happen. We need to understand what we might need to do. Um, obviously, there are a lot of unknowns in the face of climate change about how, what the next thousand year storm looks like because it's gonna happen within the next 10 years. It's not gonna be a thousand years from now. So the question is, we need to understand what that looks like. And it's an interaction with the Riverine group to understand what the sort of natural uh, pieces to that effort are to manage our interactions with the river, right? It's not about, uh, having the river be less dangerous. It's about recognizing that we live in, we need to live in harmony with that river. Um, and so, or those rivers. Um, so I wanna, I would love to see that study occur. And I, I, you know, look going after that funding to make sure that we understand if we need to build up higher, what that needs to look, what would that need to look like? What options there are that are out there? And frankly, it starts to inter interact with, uh, you know, a lot of the questions and concerns that came up around the Wrightsville Reservoir Dam and what would happen if the spillway overtopped. Um, so I'd love to see some, some work put there so we have concrete answers to plan for rather than we should do this based on what we all surmise the solution to be. And I think what's great is um, Montpelier has a lot of really smart people and some people that probably study this like as their profession. I think Jamie Ray mentioned at the last meeting that you know there's people who were studying at Dartmouth and at Middlebury College and at UVM that are experts on this. So like bringing those resource teams together to discuss that and share ideas. I think FEMA needs to do an hydrological study of the whole basin, uh, thinking about keeping the water out of Montpelier. And uh, Beavers gave me an idea a whole series of very small dams at the headwaters to just slow the water down. And, but that all needs to be done as a result of a hydrological study of where the water is coming from, how it's getting here, how it can be slowed down. And I think in, there's so many ideas here tonight, uh, but I think that uh, generally Americans like to look at one big solution I think this is going to be hundreds of small ones, whether it's hardening buildings, slowing the water down, uh, controlling the buildings, uh, what goes in, what happens to the buildings. Thank you, Eric. I have another um, sort of short term idea, and that is, is that um, Central Vermont is rich with musical talent. And uh, the idea of what um, Amy mentioned about her uh, lawn being available for uh, maybe a, a tent where there could be some musicians at and different places around town uh, so that when we do have the tourists come for the foliage season, there could be some different music going on around town. Yeah. Um, 
Building on what the gentleman in the uh, orange shirt said, um, I think we need to showcase um, our climate adaptation strategies. Rather than just doing them, we should make it very apparent, and we should have signage that indicates this is what we did, this is why we did it, and as well as the man in the checkered shirt earlier, um, maybe we can have translucent um, um, drywall in some areas where we're able to indicate this is why we put this metal two by four in, as he talked about earlier, to really show others who are going through this in the future, this is why we did this and this will help because. I'm mostly here to listen too, but one of the things, since the topic is how to support downtown, one of the ways that I think of to support downtown is to have a commitment to have our downtown because you know, I don't think it's realistic to say, well, we're going to take all the buildings and all the stores and all the jobs downtown and move them up on top of Hubbard Park or move them up on top of uh, East State Street. And I think having a commitment to doing the physical work to uh, have the buildings that are downtown, which are part of what gives Montpelier the heart and what, what makes Montpelier uh, attractive to people is to have those buildings be able to uh, continue to exist and thrive. We're going to take, what, we got five minutes, Alice? Three minutes? All right, let's, let's keep, keep it going here. There's a lot of hands, but let's, uh, let's get them all out there. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vince Morocco. My wife and I operated the Hippie Chickpea Restaurant in, on Elm Street for almost five years. Um, I just want to preface this by saying I haven't been to the last few meetings. It's the first one I've been able to attend uh, for a while. So if what I'm saying has already been said, I apologize. Um, I just wanted to follow this, this gentleman's comments. Um, you know, we are committed to doing something positive for our community because we love our living here and we're raising our children here. Um, it's been uh, pretty tough, obviously, the last few weeks. Uh, and we still don't know what we can do. Uh, for us to build a business downtown again and that space off of loans is not a viable option for us so my comment is to this group and to this uh, gathering uh, is kind of I, I've been known to have random ideas but just to share them uh, you know I'm not a political person but I think we do need to advocate uh, and change laws because to have FEMA not support businesses the way they're supporting residences, I think is just crazy to me. Uh, and that needs to change. Uh, and it's hard to understand how this is the capital city of our state and we are still in this position we are in when we are sending hundreds of billions of dollars to other countries. I just don't understand how that makes any sense. So uh, we are committed to bringing something back to the community. We just don't know what we can do yet. Uh, and it has to make sense. Um, uh, I will continue to share ideas as, as I can think of them, but I am open to anyone sharing some with us because we do not know what we should be doing right now. Well, we're really glad that you're here and expressing, you know, from the business community, you know, your feelings because I mean that's it, it's it, well that's a big task, right, to kind of change policy. You know, maybe that's what's needed, right, um, is to kind of look at how to better support our local businesses. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Okay, um, these are going to be probably the last couple here. We're going to have to move on. Yes, um, I don't know if this is already happening, but I think it would be really good to have some resource, perhaps through. Until you're alive, et cetera, a database, particularly for any downtown businesses, to share what they're doing that is forward looking, like yellow mustards, metal corrugated walls are brilliant. And there are just a lot of other ideas around town, I imagine, could be shared that are valuable, and maybe they are be. Yeah, and I think right on that, um, and on Vince's comment, earlier, I think that uh, it was wonderful and brilliant to see the volunteer hub earlier, 
um, and how uh, helpful and, and open that was, that if you needed help, you went there and people knew you needed help and people came and helped. I think that um, some of the businesses will be kind of on the knife edge of trying to figure out whether they can come back into business or not or how to do it for some months at least. Um, and I think that it might be worthwhile just having something like a, a public schedule or, or uh, an internal schedule for Montpelier Live or other organizations to reach out to businesses and say, okay, you know, we're four months out. What do you need? Where are you? Like, w it may not be possible to help those businesses all the time, but at least not to let folks kind of go out of business because people have stopped paying attention. Kind of check back in on a schedule, I think. So we are gonna we're gonna have to move on, but I'm gonna get, I'm gonna let Peter have. Um, um, we'll make sure before we close this we, we we don't have anything that we're missing here, but we gotta we have to prioritize. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to echo what Jack said. This is the it lost. We can't lose in all of this that the most important tool we have to fight climate change is a livable, walkable community like Montpelier. To shop local, to buy local, to walk, to be able to have work and places to live in a con you know, concentrated area is our best tool. And so we can't lose that as part of the process. So as long as we can keep that at the forefront, I think we will be okay. Okay, so we're gonna thank you all. Wow, we got a lot of ideas out there. Um, this is gonna be a challenge um, for us as a group to figure out how we're gonna prioritize this down to two or three. I think there's some themes um, that I'm, Alice is gonna help me in a minute here. She's finished this time, but we're trying to figure out some themes that we heard here um, that we can then kind of report back to the larger group so they hear kind of what the priorities are coming out of this group. We're not forgetting about anything that was said here. All of these are being recorded and um, may spin off on their own, um, but we, we do want to try to kind of get to some kind of consensus or a majority vote um, to kind of say these are the ones we're going to elevate that we think we can get behind to make happen. Um, so that's what we're going to attempt to do right now, which you know, when I've done these processes before, there's often a lot of pieces of paper behind me and there's dots and stuff that you can stick on the wall. And I don't have, the, you know, we're in the state house and we can't put anything on the walls and there's no dots. And so we're gonna, we're gonna do the best we can here to kind of by show of hands kind of thing on, on how, we can, how we can advance, um, you know, some of the priorities on our list um, to kind of speak to the larger group and maybe move forward um, as we meet again on September 7th. So Alice is gonna help kind of call out what we just heard, and we're gonna read them out. We have about 19 minutes um, to do this, um, and if, if let's, let's see how we can do it. So, huh, I'm not gonna read back all of the ideas, because that's many, many ideas. Um, okay. I'm just trying to kind of group them into actionable items. Um, so here's what I, and then we, we will kind of prioritize those, so let me go through them first, what I have, and people tell me if I'm missing something big. Okay. Uh, so I have some kind of major public art project, um, temporary or th we didn't go into that, um, some kind of large event like an Oktoberfest or flower bombing or something downtown. Um, hydrological studies as to what the river will do and how to react to that. Uh, investment in the community through either microinvestment, shopping downtown, helping visitors navigate downtown, um, some kind of shared storage area for businesses, sh other shared business resources like information sharing among businesses as to what they're doing, um, storytelling via murals, photos, or other means in the downtown. That's all I've got so far. Are there other uh, other ones that we, we just totally, um, I mean, we recorded a lot of things, so I wanna hear, may, let's make sure we get all the priorities kind of identified so we can start to um, determine which ones we're gonna prioritize. I wonder if it might be possible to divide the actionable ideas into short-term ideas and long-term ideas because there's some real need, I feel, for some of these short-term ideas. Um, and then we can put that aside and think about one or two long-term ideas. Okay, how's the group think? You think we maybe like, let's look at the sh short-term ideas um, and we'll identify a couple priorities there and then we'll look at the long-term and we'll identify a couple there. 
That's a good suggestion, I think. Does the group feel like that's a good idea? Okay. You want to add to that? In, in all those ideas, I, I was hearing, and I know I said one of them, but I heard a lot of people say is create program activities that get people on the street, whether it's retail or food and entertainment, regularly, not just, I mean, the Oktoberfest is a great idea, but regularly, programmatically, two days a week, three days a week, do a, and I'll say this, do a, uh, what's it called uh, in London, Portobello Street Market, all the vendors just come outside for a day, right, and they, and that's one of the most wonderful places in London to go. If you've never been there. It's incredible. And they just, the retailers are coming outside. They're not in their shops and all the people are on the street on Saturdays. It's incredible. I mean, you could do that programmatically here. But I was hearing a theme like that. I was kind of programmed outdoor activities for the foreseeable future as long as you can yeah. tolerate the weather. Okay, we got, we got that. Okay. All right. Um, so once again, we're going to, we have about, we just have a little bit of time here and we're going to, what are we missing, Katie? Or how our suggestion on how we can group this? Yeah, uh, one thing that I thought I heard that didn't get uh, noticed is uh, more funding to support the downtown businesses. Um, am I correct? <laughs> and also, yes, um, and that may be long term, but. Also, I need to hire three of me is one <laughs> note that I'm taking. So, Kate, hey, Katie, can I, can I just build off that for just one second? So how, how, does, how do we turn funding into an actionable item that we can all get behind? Like, is that like a group that's studying, like what kind of funding is out there? Or like funding, fund marked, we need a lot more money. Um, but what's the action step out of that? Community supported enterprises, microfunding, okay. And there's models of that that we can look at. So maybe a group to look at some funding models um, to help support, you know, quite frankly, everyone needs money, right? The property owners need money, the businesses need money, um, the city needs money. I mean, across the boards, right? So kind of looking at maybe some specific strategies within that. Um, so we have 12 minutes to get to the priorities, so real quick. I just wanted to add to that funding and resourcing, because I think what Katie just said is a really good point. So staffing to support all the action items that can't just be volunteer driven. And there's a discussion on leadership, um, you know, in, in one of the other rooms, and I have a feeling they're getting to a little bit of that capacity question on like, how's the city got, getting the capacity, or how are these organizations um, getting the capacity to kind of do the work that they're doing? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep us on track here and try to, um, are there, have you identified any other themes here? Or are we ready to kind of, are we missing anything from what Alice called out, from what um, a couple other ones that were added in there in terms of grouping um, the promotions, events, ongoing, one time, kind of that can be maybe one bucket of kind of marketing the downtown, promoting the downtown, it's back open. Anything that we missed before we start to go into kind of show of hands on where we want to pick our two or three and maybe we'll look at the short term first and then we'll look at the uh, the longer term um, next mitigation. so building hardening or uh, flood mitigation okay. strategies okay so m mitigation of, uh, of buildings and I, I, I know one of the topics and it's okay for us to identify here was kind of like looking upstream and thinking about what we can do in the river corridors I know there's a whole group focused on that so I might we can mark that as like the group said that's important and we'll make note of that and share that with the other groups. But I have a feeling like that's going to be covered, right? But the buildings in downtown uh, and the hardening is specific to how we can support downtown. And um, so that's a good one to mark. Anything else, Alice? All right. So let's, let's go to the short, let's go to ones that you can see that would be identified as short term. And I think unless someone has a better way of doing this, um, we can just do the old fashioned show of hands, but maybe we do like, if you think this is the best idea, raise your hand and if save your hand for what you think is the best idea. So we're gonna read all the short term and only raise your hand if you think it's the best one. They're all good ideas, but which one's your favorite? Um, quick question, okay, real quick. This has to do with the fact that I really like what you said about needing the staffing because that's what is needed. But we also had hundreds and hundreds of people that want to volunteer. And so the hub was phenomenal for that, you know, specific time frame. But that volunteer energy is still out there. And so those are 
that there's got to be a system in place to tap that to help, you know. I would volunteer for Montpelier Life. Who wouldn't, you know? So, so harn harnessing the, the volunteer spirit that we have in Montpelier while, while recognizing that we also have a capacity that needs to be addressed. So some could be filled with, you know, staffing while others can be filled with, um, with volunteers as well. So kind of looking at that whole picture of how to fill the capacity um, to get the work done. Okay. So oh. we're going to read them through, and then we're going to go through once again and, and kind of raise our hands for the ones that we think are the favorite, best and ones to move forward. You're going to count. I'm going to count. Well, let's yeah. read them through. Let's oh, read, read them through. through okay. Just so people can get a, get a picture again before I make them. we make them vote. Okay, so here's what I've got under the, the short term, and some of these could be longer term as well, but I've got them here for now. Um, look at funding models to help support businesses. Staffing to support organizations like Montpelier Alive in the city to do this work, a major art project, a large scale event, program, smaller scale, but um, regular program activities that get people on the street, like the Merchants Market at VCFA, um, shared business information sharing resources, so businesses know what each other is doing, um, murals, photos, or other storytelling within the downtown, in the, probably in the uh, storefronts. Um, investment in the community through shopping downtown, helping visitors, micro investments, um, and harnessing the volunteer spirit. Okay, so I might offer a suggestion to make this a little easier. If we can combine, combine Oktoberfest with the program activities and the storytelling, like make that all just programming, um, events programming, um, because they're very similar and the group can decide later which ones are the priorities and you know realistic and and whatnot um, and one thing I'm just gonna say is let, let's as we're voting let's think about what's gonna have the biggest impact and what's feasible right so there's high impact and low cost free is really good um, it, the high impact and high cost is also good low impact high cost let's get rid of those, right? Like that kind of thinking. High cost, low impact, we don't want those. We want the high impact, lower cost, and maybe maybe some high impact and higher cost, you know, a mix of those. So just think about the impact and think about the feasibility. All right, we have nine minutes, I think we can do this. So we're gonna give short term, um, just a few minutes, we're gonna read through them, and we're gonna do a show of hands, and we're gonna make sure, once again, these are all being recorded, and doesn't mean we can't move forward with all these. We're just sharing the bigger ideas with the, with the larger group to kind of talk about more on the 7th. So, look at funding models to help support businesses. All right, show of hands uh, that that's your, your top priority. Okay. More staffing to support organizations like Montpelier Alive and the city. Six, seven, eight, eight, maybe. Okay. Um, a major art project. Okay. Two, three. Events. Programming events. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. About eleven. Um, shared uh, information sharing resources for business. I have a feeling we're going to do that one. I think we're going to do that one. Investment uh, through microinvestment, shopping, and helping visitors. One, two, okay. Harnessing volunteer spirit, I think we're going to do anyway. But. Yeah. Harnessing volunteer spirit. Okay, and then these are the long term, longer term ones. Should we uh, let's let's um let's let's keep on the short term for just a second because if we're going to make those, uh, let's maybe have two of those and two of the longer term that we're going to focus on. So, it um it's were we missing something? You had your hand back. We created a sub organization of revitalizing Waterbury to lead our rebuilding process and hire three staff. Like, you can't, Katie cannot do this. Yeah. She can do everything on that list yeah, if you give her the people to do it. Yeah. So I would, I, I know, believe know that, that, that you have yeah. $1.6 million, like, the money is there to pay the people to do the things 
to bring more money into the community. Yeah. And your volunteers need a coordinator. Yeah. They need someone who can say, this organization needs this, we need three people. It can't be one person trying to figure out where all the volunteers go. All right, so we're gonna... So, I'm okay, thank you. You know, I, I, Justin, I've used Waterbury as an example over the last month a lot, and so we're going to lean on you all for kind of that structure. Um, so what we're noting, and tell us if we're wrong for the short term, is looking at that organizational structure, the volunteer network, um, trying to figure out how to get how to get the support where it's needed, and we can identify where that's where that's needed later. Um, but we're going to mark that as a high priority. Okay, short term to long term, right? Short and long term kind of priority, kind of fits both. And then the other one that was at the top um, is organizing events. Organizing events, promotions, and marketing. Did we hit the mark on the short term, you think? Okay. Um, Paul will get pissed at me if we're not back in like five minutes. So we're gonna we're gonna try to do the long term here in five minutes. I think we can do it. Okay, so the long term ones were uh, studies as to what the river will do shared storage areas for businesses, more funding su to support the downtown businesses via grants, uh, and building hardening and mitigation within the downtown. Did we, did we miss any of the, the longer term? Yeah. <coughs> okay, so just looking at the structure, like you know, maybe both, it's a combination of various things here, elevation, hardening, kind of looking at kind of the, arc, I don't know. Yep, yep, okay, great. And once again, I will, I will note that I think city infrastructure, this will probably come up in some of the city infrastructure as well, but it's good for us to kind of prioritize what we think is most important here as well, because it may be a high priority in a couple different groups. All right, let's go through the list here. So hydrological studies as to what the river will do in the future. Okay, one, two, um, three, four, five, okay, five, six, five or six. Uh, shared storage for businesses. One, two, three, four. More grant funding for the downtown. And I'm going to add that it's, it's more grant funding, but it's also like this is an action. So more grant funding isn't an action. The action is looking into ways for more funding to get to where it needs to go to businesses, right? To support advocating. Yeah. Okay. So, so not just businesses. So more funding to support downtown yeah. and just call it downtown, yeah. whether it's residents, businesses, property owners, yeah. all of it, right? Yeah. So looking into ways and models that are, that are existing in other places, right? Okay. Um, and building hardening and mitigation, including possibly elevation within the downtown. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's probably 11. Any others? Uh, no. There might, might be useful to note that there is an entire funding and financing discussion. There is a, yeah. That is, I imagine you're going to take that nebulous concept and put some action items around it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, he makes a good point. There is a whole discussion just on financing right now. So, um, so, so we, I think, we, yeah. Conversation to be the same because we're all part of the same function. Yeah. System. Yeah. You can't separate those two things out. It's true. It's all we're all part of one watershed. It's not just Montpelier, right? It's upstream. It's it's here. It's it's the whole the whole watershed. So, let me let me ask that one again. How many folks feel like it's important for us to consider both the you know the hardening of our buildings and and um, raising buildings as well as kind of like mitigating the wa waters coming into Montpelier and like what we can do around that. Who feels like that is an important thing for us to, okay, so that sounds like that's a, that's a priority. We may have to, you know, this group may spin off more specific focus from that to downtown while another group may, may s make some sense to look more upstream and look at some of the more natural features while we look at the built environment. So anyway, we can decide that later. Um, I think we're down to the last two minutes here. So what, is there anything that we missed on the, on the list? So the 
last two, so those two would be then the so tell us hardening what and the advocating for more grant funding would be the two long term. Did you all hear that? So let's let's go ahead, Alice. Let's let's read our short and long term, and, and let's. Ma I want to make sure the group feels good about this as we present it out. Okay, so our short-term priorities are looking at organizational structure and possibly to add staffing to support organizations like Montpelier Alive, and organizing events and promotions in the downtown. Longer-term priorities are building hardening, elevation, and mitigation in the downtown, and finding and advocating for more grant funding for the downtown. Does that, does that hit the mark? Okay, everyone feels good about that? All right, good, we did it. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else. So next steps in this are we're going to report this back to the group. We're all going to head back to the chamber. Um, but really, this is just the beginning. Um, we really encourage everyone in this room to come back on the 7th um, and, and bring other folks that maybe are knowledgeable or interested in participating in this conversation as it starts to, to grow legs. Because um, this really is, once again, going to be a community effort. And we're, it's not going to be something we're just going to hand to somebody to do. Like, we're, it's going to take all of us. So. Um, thank you all for coming out today. Um, and there's, you know, there's folks who are watching this on the recording, and they're also um, providing comments through Padlet. So folks who aren't able to attend this are actually providing their comments, and we're going to take that into consideration as well. So thank you so much.